after 15 years in that space, uh, our lease came to an end and the landlord really wouldn't negotiate with us and wanted an exorbitant rent that would just drive us out of business. If you've been to Roxbury Crossing, you've seen this plaque that also tells the story of the Southwest Corridor, the anti-highway fight. They don't understand that there are neighborhoods. It's like little boroughs. There is Jamaica Plain. It has its identity. Dorchester has its identity. Roxbury has its identity. We have three speakers who are going to Tell us uh, about Jamaica Plain, stories about it. You know, it's funny because um, I feel like all the time, you know, people sort of describe restaurants or whatever as like institutions in the neighborhood or whatever. And, uh, but it's clear from your reaction here. I was like, you guys know these restaurants? People were like, Wah! So it is clear that our first speaker tonight has established some serious institutions in the neighborhood of Jamaica Plain. So please welcome to the stage to hear a little bit of the story behind these places, Carol Downs. I want to also really do a special shout out to my life partner and business partner, Charlie Rose, who's here. Um, <laughs> I don't really often get a chance to thank Charlie in public, so I'm going to take 10 seconds. Um, owning a restaurant is really a lifestyle, and it's kind of a brutal lifestyle. It's 24 hours a day. Things can come up early in the morning, late at night, and Charlie's just 100% unconditional support, and we've been on this journey together. So I just want to say I love you and thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so... Uh, Bella Luna and the Milky Way, Edgar, is actually one business. It's one location that has two names because um, we were founded in 1993. Um, we were founded by a bunch of us who were renting at the time in Jamaica Plain. Um, our founder, Catherine Meinzer, uh, was a single parent raising her 11-year-old daughter, Megan Meinzer, who I now run the restaurant with um, 26 years later. Um, and... Kathy and Charlie and I had all worked at a nonprofit called Citizens for Safety, which was working to reduce violence in Boston. We did the first gun buyback in Boston. Does anyone remember that from like early 90s? <laughs> Charlie remembers. <laughs> um, and Kathy was looking for a new ad adventure, and you know, the, the best social program is a great job. And so she wanted to create a small business in our neighborhood that would employ herself and possibly give future employment to her daughter and create jobs in the neighborhood. And um, the great thing about small businesses is if you turn an empty storefront into a small business, you make that neighborhood safer because you create foot traffic, you have the owners coming out and cleaning the street in front of, you have, you have um, your customers coming to your business but also visiting the other businesses next door. You know, bis small businesses are multipliers of great things in neighborhoods. And so Kathy understood this, and um, but none of us knew anything about restaurants or about small business ownership. Um, so, um, but what's unique about our business is that we're a mission-driven business. So we weren't, we weren't really created to generate profit. We were created to generate community. So this is our mission. Um, we do hospitality with a purpose. So our mission is to create community through delicious food and beverages, art and music, to be a gathering place where everyone feels comfortable and has fun, and to build a better Boston by supporting the work of local nonprofit organizations. So <laughs> thank you. And this mission is um, informed by these values. We recently went through a process where we tried to um, express our values. So um, our values are generosity, inclusivity, creativity, respect, celebration, local community and world social justice. That's a big one. <laughs> um, team spirit. And we are a love-driven organization because at the foundation of our business is family. Um, who love each other. So, um, and I want to talk a minute about inclusivity. Um, 
inclusivity is strategic. It doesn't necessarily happen um, by accident. You have to make decisions that make people feel comfortable in your space. So we want to have anyone who walks in the door or anyone who wheels in on a wheelchair, anybody who walks in with a cane, um, feel comfortable in our space. And we do that through who we hire. Um, you know, representation matters, so we try to have a very diverse staff. I think there are probably 10 countries represented on our staff. And um, inclusivity happens through our entertainment programming. You know, we partner with a lot of different promoters who bring their communities into our space, and we want to make sure that all of the members of their communities feel comfortable. Um, and um, so I just wanted to talk about inclusivity because there's a lot of, <clears throat> it's just a very, it doesn't just happen. You have to think about it and create it. So um, when we first opened in 1993, um, we had a tiny little 19 seat spot um, right next to where Whole Foods is now. It used to be the high-low grocery store. We were right on the border of uh, High Jackson Square, which is a Latino and Spanish-speaking neighborhood. And so we picked the name Bella Luna because it means beautiful moon both in Spanish and Italian. And we were making a pizza restaurant, so that was the Italian part. And um, we did crowdfunding before there was such a thing. Our friend Claire Wainwright None of us had any, owned any property. We couldn't get any loans from banks. So our friend Claire Wain Wainwright suggested that we just go to all of our family and friends and ask them for $1,000. So that's exactly what we did. We went to a whole bunch of people. And we scraped together $55,000 and opened Bella Luna. <laughs> it was not enough money. So it made operating Bella Luna challenging. But we did it. And then um, a few years in, we added, we took over a spot next to us and added another uh, 12 seats or so and added a garden, garden patio and got a beer and wine license. And we've always done takeout and delivery. So this was kind of our business model for the first six years or so. And then in year six, um, the old JP Bowl space that was underneath us, uh, which was being run by the landlord at the time, he stopped running it and we had a lot of customers every weekend that were waiting in line and had nowhere to go. So we decided we'd just take over that old bowling alley <laughs> so our customers who were waiting in line could get a glass of wine. That was really the intention originally. But um, so we, there were 10 lanes of candle pin bowling down there that had been there since 1914. Um, each lane had a little gas engine lawnmower that ran the pins and these old fuse boxes. It was just unbelievable. And uh, we knocked out three lanes. We built a bar. We built a stage. We had a couple pool tables. And we created the Milky Way Lounge and Lane. So who, who's been to the Milky Way Lounge and Lanes? Anyone? <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a very, very special place. It was like your dream grungy basement where you could go and have pizza and have beer and bowl, and then there'd be some random band on the stage <laughs> or, a or a comedian or a punk, or punk musician. We did all kinds of things down there. Um, so our business model expanded a great deal, uh, and we had 55 jobs here at this location. Um, and people immediately started wanting to do their wedding at Milky Way because <laughs> everyone wants to bowl at their wedding. And then um, after 15 years in that space, uh, our lease came to an end, and the landlord really wouldn't negotiate with us and wanted an exorbitant rent that would just drive us out of business in a matter of months. So we were very lucky to find a raw space over at the brewery complex um, with a CDC landlord, a nonprofit landlord, and we got a really nice long-term rent. And um, so we moved over to the brewery complex, we were able to save 45 jobs. We were really, uh, uh, what, I, what I would say about experiencing this type of displacement, this was a displacement, we were displaced by high rent, is um, it's very traumatizing. I still have a hard time going to Hyde Square, to be honest. It's very upsetting to me to drive through that little square because um, it's incredibly expensive to be displaced, whether you're 
a resident or a business, and you have to reinvest. You essentially have to create a new business or create a new home somewhere. And uh, it was very, very difficult. But we did it, and we've been in this new space for 10 and a half years. So um, thank you for anyone who's been there or comes there. So at, um, going back to the love-driven value, so this is the ownership group right here. That's Pierre Pollen, who is a friend of ours. And there's Kathy, our founder, holding the flowers, her daughter, Megan, um, and then Charlie and myself. So we're the five owners. Pierre now, he grew up in Boston, but he now lives in Miami. And uh, these are some of our team members. This is us in the last day of the Milky Way down on the lanes. Um, this is some of our kitchen team. And every year we take our staff to the beach. We close one day and go to the beach. But, you know, hospitality begins at home. And we start our hospitality with our relationship with our staff. And many of them have been with us for 10, 15 years. And we are nothing without them and their talent and their commitment. So this is some of the love they put on the plate every day. Some of our food and drinks, we have a full bar and do take out and delivery, but we have delicious specials. I hope that makes you feel hungry looking at that. <laughs> and some quick facts. Um, we hosted the first legal gay marriage wedding reception in the United States. <laughs> that was a really, really, really powerful day. Um, the couple that won the right to get married in Massachusetts got married at City Hall and then came, had their party at the Milky Way. That was, they were Jamaica Plain residents. Um, we have 45 employees now, many with us for 10 years or more. We serve over 100,000 customers a year. We're woman-owned and operated. And, <laughs> and community investment is a part of our day-to-day op -day operations. So, um, for us, doing, going to an event, giving out food, or giving gift cards, or giving away pizza, it's happening almost every day, all, all the time. It's not something we do for PR. It's just something that we do because it's in our mission. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for visiting Bill Loon and the Milky Way. <laughs> it's all set. I got, I got some questions. <laughs> Carol. Um, don't go ahead. Yeah. Let's hear for Carol. <laughs> Thank you. So I've, I've, so I've worked, I mean, GBH is a nonprofit. I've worked in a lot of nonprofits. And nonprofits tend to, even the good ones, it's sort of sometimes a struggle to stay alive financially. Restaurants, also, low margin businesses, even those who are in it for a profit, struggle to stay alive financially. How do you make this sort of hybrid sort of approach work? Because it strikes me that you have to make some serious, like it takes some serious commitment and decisions to make it work kind of with that same mission-driven spirit. Uh, thank you for that question, Edgar. I'd say we never give up. Um, we change. You have to change all of the time as a restaurant. You have to... Um, change your space, you have to change your menu, you have to assess things that aren't going well. Let's say there's an entertainment night that's not doing well, you have to end it and try to come up with a new entertainment night. You have to constantly be assessing what you're doing. You also have to adopt new technologies that come along. Um, so I would say embracing change is the way to survive and never giving up. I like that. <laughs> those are. I think those are both good pieces of advice, not just for running a restaurant, but maybe for life. Um, did I see in your bio that you studied philosophy in college? <laughs> I did, but I did <laughs> study philosophy in college, but yeah. I also worked in the dining hall all four years. Oh, ah, okay, okay. <laughs> worked my way up to dish room supervisor, so Huge. who knew? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you talk about how, like, you know, there was a decision to start this business. You guys hadn't really had restaurant experience or you hadn't had like small business experience. Was there like a, was there like a drunken night at someone's house where you were like, we're gonna do it. Like, what do you remember about, I'm always fast, uh, let me say it this way. I'm always fascinated by people who take the plunge. 
I think a lot of people have dreams or ideas or they're working their job and they're like, man, I wish I could just do this other thing. And 99% of people keep it as a dream. And a very small percentage of people take the plunge and do it. So I'm interested in like the moment when you were like, we're, no, we're doing it. What do you remember about that? Well, I have to give all credit to Kathy Meinzer, our founder. She is fearless. She is uh, brilliant at um, inspiring people to uh, commit resources and time and energy into startup. Um, she, it was really her who was taking the plunge and invited us to plunge with her, and so we all went together. But you were I, like, yeah, that looks I, like a fun <laughs> ride. I'll jump on. Exactly. <laughs> like, sure, why not? <laughs> Excellent. All right, so when uh, you once uh, described the Bella Luna story as a JP story, why is it a JP story? I think it's a JP story because, A, we were all living in JP and raising our children there. Our son was 10 months old when we opened Bella Luna, and now he's 26. Um, it's a story, uh, well, JP has something like 300 nonprofits. So I think our mission and our values uh, are shared by many people who are in JP. And people who live in JP are very devoted to the neighborhood and its concept and its values. True. <laughs> a lot of which are the same values that we have. So inclusivity and generosity and creativity. You know, we have the Wake Up the Earth Festival in the spring. We have the Lantern Parade in the fall. Like entertainment and arts, all of that stuff is all part of JP. So our businesses reflect the values and culture of, of the neighborhood. Carol Downs, everybody. Let's hear it for her. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we're going to bring our next speaker up here uh, right now. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. So as I was saying earlier, there's, there's a funny thing about neighborhoods because I think, I think especially the further we get off into, like, human development, the easier it is to forget that the physical has a serious effect on how things work. You know what I mean? Whether that be a neighborhood or anything. I mean, we live in such virtual wor worlds now. It, it's sort of easy to forget the fact that one of the things that makes a neighborhood a neighborhood is just physical closeness, right? And the fact that, like, we also, as humans, alter our landscape, that helps define what are the neighborhoods in a city. And we're going to hear the story... Uh, right now of JP and how JP was, I don't know if saved is the right word, but we're going to hear about how people in JP liked their neighborhood to a certain extent the way that it was and came together to make sure it stayed that way. So please welcome to the stage our next speaker, Dr. Carolyn Crockett. I am a neighborhood kid. I grew up in Dorchester and what's interesting to me is that, as, as we all know, Boston is a city of neighborhoods. And sometimes we tell the story about how those neighborhoods are so fragmented and kind of splay apart. And so growing up in Dorchester, I was really connected to my neighborhood, but I didn't know much about the rest of the city. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit of work I've been doing to try to tell a bigger story of, of the city and what it has meant when people across neighborhoods have really come together to, to fight for social justice and to fight against highways, which was a moment in the 1960s when we thought that was good, that was necessary, and that was the future. And so I come to this story as someone who uh, was a neighborhood person, really not knowing a lot about the city's history, and then someone who took that kind of curiosity to grad school. So what I'm sharing is some of my grad school research, which turned into a book last year, so really excited to share. Thank you. Uh, this story, People Before Highways, and sharing it with you will, will just, I guess, remind us of what we can do when we really bring ourselves together across neighborhoods and realize our power. So a real special sense of gratitude to the residents of JP who rallied together to fight, to stand up, and to make a promise that we could be better then and now. So I'll give a shout out to yourselves and a hand for what JP has accomplished. So how many people know about this story? 
How many people remember that there was this story, this like crazy idea to have an inner belt, or I-95 coming through, city, through the city, and people had the sense to stand up and say no, to say hell no. So I thank you as someone who is a beneficiary of that story because I was not there in the 60s, but as someone who came along in the 70s, I can truly say thank you for people that stood up on my behalf. And so this book, uh, this story, really starts on this day. So this is January 25th, 1969, a day when about 2,000 people showed up on the State House steps downtown to say no, hell no to the idea of a highway. There had been this ambitious plan from 1948 to bring roads through the city, uh, and then it really wasn't until about 1956 when Eisenhower signs off on federal aid, which made money available to build these interstates. And so to the tune of 90 cents on the dollar, a city could be reimbursed for building these big roads. And so on this day uh, is a really high watermark of people across the city and across the region coming together to tell the new governor no. And so you can see by some of their signs and you can see the multiracial uh, element of the coalition that people were really, really clear about what they wanted and they were clear about standing together to express that to the governor himself. And so here on your, on your right side, you see this guy, does anyone know who that guy is? Francis Sargent, that is the governor. He had been sworn into office just a few days before, and he shows up to work in his office, and all these people come out, and how do they look? Do they look happy to see him? No, not even the little altar boys look impressed by the governor, right? And so people were really, they were upset because Governor Sargent had a pro-highway position and the opposition had grown across the city uh, and across the region to really trying to put pressure on the new governor to basically stop the highway plan. So this is 1969 uh, and we remember this story. So some of you may look at this mural and it may look familiar to you. Have you seen this before? on the side of Micro Center in Cambridgeport, this mural, right, that was put up in 1980 by Bernie Lagasse, who really wanted to make a, a sign that showed that there, here's the bulldozer. Here is the federal uh, agent bringing I-95 into Boston through Cambridge. And then what shows up are all these people ready to meet that machine. And so this is a mural, again, that was put up in 1980. And if you've been to Trader Joe's or if you've been to Cambridgeport, you've seen this on the side of the building, which is a real testament to this story. This is a story that we're proud of. We got together, we stopped a highway, and we want to make sure that people know the story. So it's here. Uh, you may have also seen the story here. If you've been to Roxbury Crossing, you've seen this plaque that also tells the story of the Southwest Corridor, the anti-highway fight. What's interesting to me about this is uh, on the top of the actual mural of the plaque, there are about 200 names of residents from all the neighborhoods across Boston, including uh, JP residents who were engaged in this battle. And so you can see what was the original highway plan. You can see some of what it was meant to look like. And the community is literally telling its story in the landscape of where the highway was supposed to be and how it was successfully stopped. We also have the Wake Up the Earth Festival, yes. This festival, which was uh, launched in 1979, was a, a festival to celebrate the defeat of the highway. And so when residents and activists got together, they wanted to create a festival that would bring people together to celebrate Earth Day, but also to celebrate the activism that was necessary to defeat I-95. So you may or may not realize that every time you go to the Wake Up the Earth Festival, you are also celebrating the power of social justice and community residents coming together to bring change and to stop road building. So congratulations to you, yeah? Uh, and so also on here, I wanted to just show what the plan was, right? What were we stopping? What are we celebrating? So the plan was actually to develop I-95, which as you know, is a continuous asphalt, that strip of asphalt that goes from Maine to Florida in a pretty much unbroken uh, ribbon for 1,900 miles. But there are two breaks in I-95. There's one break around Maine, around Portland. Those of you that have been there, you know that. And there's another break where? Boston, ding, 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 yes. And the reason why there's a break in I-95 in Boston is because we said no, because we said hell no, 
right? And so you can actually not drive into downtown Boston on I-95. You have to loop around. You have to do that strange thing where you get on 128. You have to get on the pike. It's very confusing. But the original plan was that you would be able to take I-95 right into downtown Boston. So just like all of these capitals that you see, whether it's New York or Philly or Baltimore, you can take I-95 right into those downtowns and through neighborhoods that actually were displaced because of that road building. But in Boston, we had something else in mind. And so this is what the road would have looked like. And so essentially, uh, the dotted line is showing you what would have been the road plan. And so the dotted line are going up I-95, taking us through Peabody, and then snaking around the middle of the city, creating this thing called an inner belt, a loop. Uh, and then in dotting through all the way back down through the Southwest Expressway, which will become the Southwest Corridor or the Southwest Corridor Park later when we defeated the road. And it's bringing you out through toward Providence. And so literally the alignment that's taking you through Roxbury and Jamaica Plain was, um, was the bullseye for trying to figure out how do you get 170,000 cars through the city on an eight to 10 lane road that looked a little bit like this. And so if you imagine what we're actually looking at is you're looking east. So uh, up there on the top is the Prudential Building. You're right around the, the, the road is, is snaking back by what would have been Ruggles Station for us today. Uh, this is Mission Extension. And so you're looking at the alignment of Columbus Ave, of Tremont and Washington Street. And so you see this incredibly monstrous 10-story uh, high at Points Road, 8 to 12 lanes, really reconfiguring the city. What's fa fascinating about this image for me is that whenever highway uh, engineers or transportation planners draw a road, there's never any traffic, right? So it looks great. <laughs> it's wonderful, but a schema that would actually have really ripped up the city and actually displaced even that more thousands of people in Roxbury and JP and the South Bend in particular. But we said no. We said hell no. That's right, exactly. And so you can't talk about neighborhoods and you cannot talk about change without really lifting up the voices and the people who made it possible. And just as Carol was talking about this, this commitment to inclusivity, which is such a hallmark to me of JP, uh, this commitment to home, these are some of the people and the actors who were so essential to this. We have um, Femke Rosenbaum, who Fleury you know, right, from Make Up the Earth. Yeah, you have um, Mildred Haley there for activism, exactly from uh, Bromley Heath. Uh, you have lots of folks there, Chuck Turner, Stokely Carmichael, who had an incredible friendship that actually was really essential to some of the organizing that happened here. Uh, you have Byron Rushing, Fred Salvucci, Tani Lee, Tony Pangaro, David Lee, who would be an architect who was essential for the design of the Southwest Corridor, and Gloria Fox. Uh, and again, Anne Hirschfang. So these are some of the voices that I try to lift up in my project, but just as a reminder to us that it's the hands that hold. It's actually residents and organizers and people in this room who say we were committed to something else that delivered this victory for us. And I always want to make sure that to pause and to make sure we know exactly who we are, who they are, because it's on their shoulders and through their fighting that we have the success of, of today. Chuck Turner, uh, a really a prominent, uh, not only activist in this moment, but he was the architect. He was the chair of something called the Greater Boston uh, Committee on the Transportation Crisis. He was also the chair of the, uh, the, Bus the Black United Front, a black radical nationalist organization that really had really robust transportation ideas that was, was essential for, for transforming the space. Stokely Carmichael, again, who goes on to be called uh, Kwame Torre, a really interesting friendship between Stokely Carmichael and Chuck Turner that's little known. Uh, I have a book you can read if you want to find out about that, but that story would be really important to Boston's story itself. Um, and so this is an image of what the clearance looked like. So this is around 1966, 67. We're essentially at Roxbury Crossing, approaching JP. So if you imagine, if you look up to the top there, you can see the, a shadow of the Prudential Building. So this is what the middle of the city looked like because the, it was seen as a done deal. The governor was in support of the road. The president had released all this federal money and clearance had begun. So if you can imagine what it would be like to live here and to try to figure out what could you do to resist something that seemed like it was, it was, un, uh, it was a fight that was unwinnable. But even in the face of this, uh, people came together and said, we can do better than this. 
we can imagine a future that is much more robust, that is much more inclusive, and that is much more true to the people who live here right now and can really think about the future for their own families. Yeah? And so that was the slogan. And so here between, now we're between essentially um, Roxbury Crossing and Stony Brook on the embankment there in the middle of the night, activists got together, they got some paint, and they put up this sign. And this was the rallying call of the movement itself. Stop I-95, people before our highways, actually using the, uh, the elevated train line as a, a tagging uh, canvas to really make clear to people what was not only the mission, the hope, but the rallying call of a movement that pulled together people from across uh, just about every neighborhood in Boston, as well as 12 to 14 other suburban cities and towns in solidarity. And so this is just bringing us back to where we started, January 25th, 1969, when so many of the protesters showed up on the steps of the State House. Um, and just a little bit after that, activists had assembled, actually a couple days after the assassination of Dr. King, to also make claims on the state to assert this different kinds of consciousness about blackness, about black being beautiful as a type of political rallying call, but also as a way to make new state, new claims on the state in the sense of what radical inclusivity in space could be regardless of race. And so the story kind of picks up these threads about telling us who we can be, who we must be at a moment of, of intense political crisis, but also a moment of intense uh, political opportunity. And so essentially just a year after folks had showed up on the steps of the State House, uh, the governor makes this statement. Governor Sargent says on February 11th, 1970, he says, four years ago, I was commissioner of the Department of Public Works, which he was, our road building agency. Then nearly everyone was sure highways were the only answer to transportation problems for years to come. We were wrong. And in issuing that statement, History was changed. The roads were stopped. Clearance ended. A new phase of development began for Boston, for JP, for Roxbury. Um, and these are some of the wins. We changed uh, federal transportation law so that there could be funding made available for mass transit and not just highways. Uh, we began the construction of the Southwest Corridor in 1979. In 1987, the New Orange Line and the Southwest Corridor Park were dedicated. And so when you look at this map, right, and you look at the orange line, what you're actually even, what you're looking at and you're, you're, you're mem memorializing is what would have been the root of the highway and the activism of people to make a new kind of transit possibility possible, but a new kind of political and physical configuration of the city. And so for those of you who are by orange line riders, orange line riders, yes. So you are riding the rails of history every day when you sit on that train. And so to you, I say congratulations and ashe, and to just kind of lift up the people of JP who made so much of this victory. A few things, a uh, few questions for you. Uh, one, you wrote a book about this, right? I am impressed by anybody who writes a book. It's possible, you can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it, how did you do it? Um, Was it hard? I think this story is a really complicated story. There's so many layers to it. And some of you may know that um, a few years ago, I started this nonprofit called My Town. And what we you're, did, you're, yes. Yeah, you're yeah. killing my, my second question oh, was yes. about My Town. Okay. So that's fine. So Tell us about Charlie My Town. Charlie Rose was in the building. He was on the board forever. And so we built this work together. And so essentially, My Town worked with high school students from Boston Public Schools to research community and local history. And we took a spin on trying to figure out how to tell a contemporary or 20th century stories in Boston, imagine, right? So we're very good at telling the colonial history. We're very good about, you know, Paul Revere and all that. But after 1776, it just falls off, right? So, um, so trying, to tell, trying to tell contemporary stories of the city was amazing. And then whenever we would give these tours, which the young people created, we would st have people stop on the Southwest Corridor Park. And I was always amazed that on the park, uh, most of the times there were many residents on the tour, they would want to tell the story about the park. So it's, it's, it's the moment on the tour where it always flipped. The tour guide would become the audience. 
and the audience would be t teller of the story. And so we did, uh, did these tours for almost 10 years, and we toured about 14,000 people. And over and over, when people would stop on the, on the corridor and tell the story, it just made a deep impression on me that we are proud of this story. We want to tell it. It is like a, a source of, of pride, for sure. And so in grad school, I, um, I just wrote like a seminar paper on it, like an 18-page yeah, yeah. paper. And then it just it grew, and it was my dissertation topic and became a book. That's amazing. So yeah. you did... Uh, you, I'll take it. <laughs> you did... You, you did part of your schooling at the London School of Economics, is that right? Yeah. How, uh, how does our transportation and their transportation <laughs> match up, not match up? Um, are they better at it than us, or are we, we better at it than them? We have room for say, growth here. We have room for growth, yeah. That's fair. <laughs> fair yeah, enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yikes. Um, Governor Baker, hear me. Hear me. <laughs> yeah. How much of an outlier, like this story of like what happened here with 95, like I think about you're welcome. Uh, I think about the highway system in the United States of America and how sort of big and sprawling it is. And, you know, in many ways, a very good thing. Yeah. But also, I, I wonder, like, how unique is what happened here with this sort of resistance and saying, like, you, no, 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 you're not going to destroy this part of our city. Right. Um, and how many other neighborhoods and cities and pieces of cities ended up not coming together and fighting and getting completely transformed and destroyed as yeah. the highway system got built? Yeah, that's a great question. So the interstate highway system, as it really starts to expand in the late 50s, uh, are, are, are contributes to this uh, phenomenon called uh, highway revolt. So there were neighborhoods and cities across the country that were engaged in these kinds of ba battles. So Boston is not exceptional. And Boston was sort of late to it. So as you can see from that initial image, it's 1969 when we get engaged in this fight. And many other cities had already had either won their highway battles, when I think of some of the fights in San Francisco, or even some of the mixed fights in Miami and New Orleans. So this was not an unknown um, uh, phenomenon. But what's interesting is that even though we were late to the game here, we, uh, the governor, Governor Sargent's commitment to, to lobbying, um, going to D.C. and getting federal funding for mass transit, which is how we get uh, the, the new orange line, how we got the extension on the red line. So the, the red line, we got the federal money, we got extended the red line from Harvard to Alewife and also extended the red line to Braintree. Um, and then some of the new upgrades to the commuter rail. So all of that was because activists here and the governor went to change the federal law. So that is a distinction that Boston has that we can be proud of. So not the first city to fight a highway, not the first city to win that battle, but certainly we distinguish ourselves by being able to really have um, such a, an important impact on federal funding. And that funding, although we were the first city to tap the funding, many other cities across the country were able to, to tap that, to, to develop out mass transit, which is a big deal in the 80s, big deal. If I want to get your book, where do I go? <laughs> Uh, my preferred bookseller is a frugal bookstore, which is in Roxbury in Dudley Square. So local business, uh, support them. Love that. Uh, but you guys know how the story ends, so you can also get it from your library. You can save your money, and you can get it that way too, which is good. Let's hear for Carolyn one more time. Do we do we all know about the Pineapple Diaries? All right, that's good. We're gonna get the inside backstory. We're gonna get the insider story. Uh, let's welcome to the stage the woman behind the Pineapple Diaries and many other things, Paloma Valenzuela. Oh, this little muted montage in the background is um, the first and second season trailers. And then after that, um, I uh, extracted clips from the show and just... Um, wrote a title card of where that location is. Um, and it, doing it, when I was doing it, I realized how much we really did film in JP. I guess everybody knows that, but <laughs> I was just like, it, you know, the, it really, literally, everything, almost everything we shot is in JP, although it is also a Boston show. We film in other parts of Boston, but a lot of it is JP, so. <laughs> Am I right? So again, let me just get a sense from uh, the crowd here. How many people know about the Pineapple Diaries, have watched it? 
good portion. How many people have no idea what we're talking about? Also okay, thank you for the hands. That's great, it's gonna give us a sense of this. All right, Paloma, what the heck is this thing? The Pineapple Diaries is a comedic web series that is available on YouTube. Um, it is a sitcom, but web series, so uh, episodes that are just a bit shorter, some of them really are just as long as a sitcom would be, um, with some um, interludes, um, every other episode where characters sort of tell a story about their backgrounds, um, where they come from, their family histories, and the show is about four women in the neighborhood of Jamaica Plain. They're, in the first season, they're in their late 20s. Um, in the second season, they're veering towards 30s, and now they're in their 30s in the third season, which it will be airing, airing, <laughs> which will be launched on YouTube um, in November, next month. So uh, the show tells the story of four Dominican-American women um, in Boston and Jamaica Plain and just going through everyday life stuff. So like every other sitcom, love, friendships, everyday absurdities and chaos, <laughs> that's life. And uh, I, w if I want to watch it and haven't, I'm going to walk away from tonight and go like, I got to find out about this. Well, I go to YouTube and just search Pineapple Diaries and I find it. Yes, there might right. be some other pineapple things that pop up, so... <laughs> Beware. You're welcome to Disclaimer. watch those as well. Um, how did this thing get started? What's, what's the backstory of you launching this web series? Um, so I have been a writer since I was younger. Since I was like 14, I started writing plays. I went to high school at Boston Arts Academy. I wanted to be an actress. And uh, I um, started focusing more on writing towards the end of my high school years. And I went to college at Emerson College for writing for film and television. And um, I wanted to be a writer, a filmmaker, director. I wanted to be a screenwriter. I hadn't really thought about television as much. But um, I moved to the Dominican Republic after graduating Emerson College, I lived in DR for five years. And, um, you know, I was freelancing and script editing, but I really wasn't doing my own projects. Um, and I was working as a uh, theater teacher, and it kind of just felt like I was kind of letting it get away from me just a little bit. Editing other people's scripts, doing script coverage for other people's stories, and not doing my own thing, and working uh, on school productions with students that I love so much, but it was, you know, really didn't have time to do my own thing. So when I decided to quit my job as a teacher and move back to Boston, this was in 2014, I knew I wanted to take the opportunity to start something that was like, that, you know, could be like a passion project for me. Your voice. Yeah, like my voice and, or the voice of just, I guess, stories of voices that I feel like I don't really get to see that much on television. And that was really the idea of it. You know, I, I was in my late 20s and I was surrounded by, you know, incredibly dynamic women, Dominican women, women of color. Um, we were going through life stuff. We were going through breakups. We were going through adulting. We were going through student loans. We were going through, um, you know, all of this stuff. And I just feel like I didn't see characters like us on television, but I know that we existed because we exist. And so that was it. So I was just like, okay, well, I love shows like Seinfeld, but no one on that show looks like me. And, um, I just feel like I wanted to do a show that was like universally funny or relatable, but just that the women telling the stories are pe women of color. And if you can't relate, get, get with it. Like get over it and get with it because we're here and we're going, we're, you know, universal stories can be told by women of color as well. And you said it generally in Jamaica Plain because you are essentially from Jamaica Plain, right? Yes, I'm from Jamaica Plain. I've been in Jamaica Plain since 1994, right? I was in the second grade. I remember Bella Luna, we were just talking about it. We'd got our pizza takeout it went from the Hyde Square location. Um, and so Jamaica Plain, I think, you know, to me, growing up in Boston, Especially, I don't know what it is about this city, but especially in the arts, you know, even at Boston Arts Academy, really, um, not because of the teachers, but just the community of students, like, we all knew that if we wanted to do something with ourselves, we had to get out of here. Like, really? we need to get out. 
um, you know, you want to be an actress, you need to get out of Boston. You need to go to New York. You need to go to L.A. Yeah. Um, you want to be a director. You want to be a writer. You need to get out of Boston. And um, I just feel like a lot of my favorite shows are um, set in New York City. They're set in L.A. And I just feel like there's something about those cities that, like, everyone knows that they're allowed to be cool and they're allowed to be proud of their cities. And I feel like with Boston, it's like people outside of Boston, I feel like don't understand, don't understand how cool this city is. Like, and I feel like it, if anything, if this show didn't accomplish anything, at least it could be something fun for people to say, oh, I live down that, I live right next to that bodega or I get my food there all the time or, whoa, that's right near my house. I think that New Yorkers get to experience that and, you know, uh, residents of Los Angeles get to experience it, but Boston, not so much. And so I just feel like Boston's super cool and there's nothing whack about it. Like, it, I mean, it's a complex city. Things, you know, has its ups and downs, but like every other city, but this is a cool ass city. You know, it's interesting because... <laughs> I love this city, like, I don't, and I just feel like, I've come to the point where I'm just like, I love being an artist here, you know, I really do, and I, you know, I'm very happy to, to continue work in LA or New York, but I feel like, you know, repping for my city means a lot to me. So, I, I'm interested in this, because I feel like, you know, through, let, let's take like maybe the last 10 years or whatever, right, and, and to a certain extent before this, but like, you know, there's there's an established industry in New York, there's an established industry in Los Angeles in terms of making television, making movies, etc. Boston obviously has made a play in the last like 10 years, I think at, in a concerted effort, maybe beyond what they had done before, in terms of being like, oh no, 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 you can make movies here, right? Tax breaks, whatever it is, you have your, you know, your Ben Afflecks and your you know, your people making movies about Boston, um, winning Academy Awards and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it presents a particular image of Boston, yeah. right? And do you feel like they've sort of missed the mark to a certain extent or pigeonholed Boston in a way that these other cities haven't, whether it be diversity or the people who live here or a reflection of the city? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, the thing is, and this, this is how I feel about, uh, you know, representation is when we talk about representation, we're talking about the people that don't get represented as much. But, you know, I, that doesn't mean that not everybody's story matters. Like, you know, for, for how many people really enjoy the history of the mafia or South Boston or right. this sort of like super, these crime stories, like there is validity in all these stories. Like it's entertainment. Like people are going to go see these movies. It's cool. Like I'm fine with it. It's just that it's the, it's the, it's the lack of opportunity to see more than that is the thing. So I'm cool with Ben Affleck coming and doing his thing. It's not about less, it's not about no Ben Affleck. It's about right. more of other parts of Boston that I don't think people get to see. And I think, I do think that, um, you know, because there is a more established industry in New York, people get to see corners of New York and people understand the boroughs. And I really believe that when people come to Boston, they really think that, you know, what you need to see is downtown Boston and Newbury Street or, you know, you know the, the main sort of central parts, but they don't understand that there are neighborhoods. It's like little boroughs. There is Jamaica Plain, it has its identity. Dorchester has its identity. Roxbury has its identity. And these are like magnificent uh, pockets of the city that no one even knows exists. And there are people, and I've talked to people outside of Boston, they don't even feel like they want to come to Boston. They have this idea that Boston is um, racist. They have an idea that Boston is, um, you know, boring. <laughs> they have this idea that Boston is not diverse at all, that it, there are no people of color in this city. They don't even, you know, when people have seen this show, they said, oh my God, I didn't even know there's like a Washington Heights in, in Boston. And it's not like a Washington Heights, it's a Jamaica Plain. But no one knows that it exists. And so my thing is, it's not just, you know, if someone was to just see Pineapple Diaries and it was the only thing coming out of Boston, people were like, well, that's not the only Boston, because it's not the only Boston. This is one pocket of Boston. This is a group of stories in a made up, made up world um, set in Jamaica Plain. And it's just the idea that like there are so many stories to be told in Boston, and I think that the world should see them, because I think it's a really interesting, I think these are really interesting places. And the people that live here are really interesting people. <laughs> so. You know, you mentioned uh, sort of in passing just a few minutes ago, you were like, these, 
these shows that I love, and I wanted to make something like that. What are some of the shows that you love? Oh, no, don't do this. Yeah, really? No, it's done. It's just been done in front of all of these people, so oh. sorry. Well, I do love... You said Seinfeld. Yeah, I love the realm of Seinfeld, Larry okay. David. I love Curb Your Enthusiasm. I love that kind of sort of... Um, awkward humor. That awkward <laughs> situational comedy, people yeah. are assholes kind of um, shows. Um, I love Insecure right now. I think it's wonderful. I love Atlanta. I think it's brilliant. Um, I, I mean, I could go on and on. I, I mean, I, I watch a lot of TV. I, <laughs> I really do watch a lot of TV. you work in TV, which is like... You know. Yeah, that's what so, I say. Yeah, it's to an justify. Excuse. You're to just justify. like, man, I'm I working. I watch the British Bake Off right too, now. though. So <laughs> I like British literally Bake watch Off. everything. Downton Abbey, okay, like. <laughs> GBH produced. Yeah, hey. <laughs> Thanks for the plug. <laughs> it's a great show. Um, you, <laughs> we were talking in the uh, in the old green room there. So you essentially, as an actress have won a Golden Globe in the Dominican, like the Golden Globe of the Dominican Republic. You have won one of these as an actress. What was the movie and how uh, did the, you end the up The movie's in called it? Un Cuarto de Josue. It takes place in Puerto Plata in the Dominican Republic. And um, I started in the project as the script editor <laughs> for the project, the script sort of supervisor. Yeah. Not supervisor, but um, while the screenwriter was writing it, she would send me her, edit, uh, her drafts. I would help her with coverage edits. I would edit some scenes, send it back to her. And that was the process. So in the process with her and her husband, who is the director, we did some... Uh, you know, readings out loud. Yeah. And uh, they, you know, during the readings, they're like, oh my God, you need to play this character. Like, and this character needs to be Dominican American. Like, let's make her Dominican American. And, um, and that was it. So I said, yes, of course. And then we did the movie and, and I was nominated. How, how, for you, as somebody who has experience in the industry in both the, the Dominican Republic and here in the United States, are they very different? Like the processes, the how you get projects done, et cetera. Is it easier in one place, different from one place to the other? Um, I feel like... I feel like a lot of the work that I do here in, in Boston and the United States is very independent. So I almost feel like my experiences here, I don't, I don't know all the time because I just feel like everything I do, I sort of um, self-fund, you know, do the fundraising. Um, you know, You're just building I'm, your own road. Yeah, You're grants. You're like carving and, out your own Exactly. Path. Whereas in DR, you know, I work in the industry as a really support crew member so you know you get the person to you know but it is a community so people call you and they want to know if you're interested if you're available for this month to work as the assistant director on this feature film or this commercial and you do it and you kind of have to have some sort of a sag thing it's yeah. called the cine cine um and other than that that's yeah so i don't i don't know I, they're I, they're different because i think the way i approach them you know, are different. Yeah, 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 yeah. So th this project here, so you you put it out on YouTube. Is there is there bigger dreams for it? Like, are you like, let's get this thing on Netflix. Let's get a huge budget for it. Or is this like just kind of like a passion project on the side and there's something bigger in the works? I mean, I feel like just even just for sustainability, I would like to have um, more resources. So if that means being able to collaborate with a network, that would be like a dream come true. For me, it would be definitely the goals. I could be you know, self-sufficient and I could work with other professionals and have a more of a team and not feel like I'm doing so much of it by myself. Um, but in terms of this project, like if, if it's meant to live, um, in this small little community online, then then that's what it's meant to be, and I'm I'm happy with it. I'm just surprised at how many people are even watching it at all. So how many people are watching it? I don't know. We oh you know. I mean I don't you know. You can see right on your we, YouTube yeah, we, page it's how like, many views yeah, it has. Yeah, it's like so it's people? like it's modest, but it's like so it's nice because I feel like people really are watching it. You know, it's yeah. not like a bunch of like clicking people like trolls or whatever. We don't yeah, have yeah. that yet, so we're not that big. But we have like. You know, probably around, you know, 1,500, 2,000 views per That's episode. pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy with it. <laughs> so, so what is keeping you going? Like, you're, you're into season three of this. Like, I can think of, like, two dozen projects that I've done that I've abandoned after, like, six months or four months, right? But, like, you're, you're going you're gonna to launch a 
third season of this thing, which means it, it has to mean something to you. So, like, what is driving you here? You know, honestly, we did season one, and, you know, some people watched it. We did have people watching it, but no one was really talking about it. And then we decided to do a season two because we wanted to do it, like the cast and crew. We were like, this was fun. Let's just do it again. And we were given a grant by the um, Boston Foundation for the Arts and um, uh, Creative City. And so we were you like... You say given a grant, but I suspect you did a lot of work to earn that oh, grant. Oh, I mean, you have to apply <laughs> and well, hopefully people... Right. Like, but you apply but, for grants like, and they don't happen. But, but so. just saying, like, uh, they just gave us a grant. No, it's not like yeah, they yeah, watched yeah, no. this, like, you... You have to apply. Yes. You have to apply for the grant. I, um, we, we received the grant. And so we were like, okay, we'll do it. We have more substantial budget. And after season two, really, I feel like, you know... It, you know, it kind of it was what it was. And then I went to DR for a year uh, again, and I, and I worked on a, a few feature films um, as a second assistant director. And I came back, and I was talking to a friend, and I was just like, I felt, I was like feeling bummed, because I was like, we did, we did all this work, and it's there, but that's it. And, um, and my friend recommended, she was like, why don't you tour the show somehow? Like, why don't you do something? Like, do a workshop and show the episodes and... And I was like, oh, well, this is my friend Denise Delgado, who uh, she knows how much I appreciate her because honestly, I feel like this whole wave happened because she um, inspired me to, to even do the little work writing workshop tour. So I decided to uh, do a hybrid like monologue writing workshop and Pineapple Diaries screening that would include me teaching people some of my approaches to monologue writing and then screen an episode of Pineapple Diaries so that people could see the show as opposed to waiting to get a hashtag going. It's like, I just yeah, yeah. decided to go physically to different locations. So I went to, um, you know, Holyoke, Massachusetts. I went to New York. I went to Somerville. I went to um, the Lyric Stage. I went to all these different venues in Boston to do this, like, monologue writing tour. And after that, it felt like it was like people kept asking for the monologue writing tour and the screening. And then um, some publications started talking about us. And then some publications in New York started talking about us. And then it just kept going. I don't know. I don't even know. I'm almost thinking about it now as I'm saying it out loud. I didn't even like, really what think. What did of, happen? Yeah. How did it, this happen? But it did feel like it was like this, me doing this sort of like touring and the screenings of the show and, and seeing people face to face and having people connect with the show in a you know real space feels like it got some sort of ball rolling and then people started talking about the show and I was and and asking if there was going to be a third season and I was like well I guess if people want a third season why not so we did the fundraising and we didn't get as much budget as the last time but I decided we're, let's just do it and now I'm in the thick of it and now I have to finish it so <laughs> that's I mean, it you publicly said it's coming next month yes so I did publicly you're say so pretty boxed that's it. in there that's how I do it because if I yeah I gotta do it I already I know said that. it so now I gotta I do it I work on deadline like if me I didn't too. have it if I didn't if somebody above me was not like and it needs to be done now yeah. I would just like I'm the same way you I would give obsess me a date. about it forever yeah right um, so what's no, the? <laughs> no, all right. So you you have you have done acting. You've done assistant directing. You're writing. You're you know like all of this stuff. What is it? What is it all in service to? What's what right now for you is the big next thing? What's the what's the thing you're trying to achieve? What's the big goal? Is it what you're gonna? launch a bigger series, you're going to do this for the next 10 years, you're going to write and direct a movie, like, wh where are you heading toward? Oh, um, <laughs> I'm like looking at my mom, can someone give me a lifeline? I, um... <laughs> no judgment, like... No, I don't know. No, I don't and know. it's perfectly Honestly, okay to be like, I don't know, I'm taking yeah, projects one at a time yeah, as they for come. for real, yeah. yeah. Which I is really, also really a legitimate that, answer. Yeah, I think that um, I kind of feel like I'm doing the thing that I love to do and I feel extremely privileged yeah. to be able to do it. And so I just want to feel like I, I really want to work to like, I really want to work to make this, to, to, to make it worth it. You know what I mean? Like I don't want to waste this, this opportunity that I have to do something that I love. So I think the first thing is just that it really makes me happy. Probably it's the only thing I really know how to do. So that's the second thing. <laughs> I'm not good at anything else. Um, and then I, I feel like, you know, this was not planned. You know, it's not like in 2014, I was like, I'm gonna, I am going to 
rep for my city. I'm going to be asked, I'm, WGBH is going to call me up to rep Jamaica Plain. Like, I'm about to be the Jamaica Plain spokeswoman. I'm out here in these streets, no, these that Jamaica Plain a, streets. A noble goal. But at the end of the day, it was like the, the neighborhood was calling, the neighborhood was what inspired the writing, which was what inspired the, the situational comedy. It inspired this world. And it and through the processes made me feel like I found an identity in my city and in my neighborhood. And I, parts of identity I've been looking for, for for so long. And you grow up, I was you know biracial, Dominican, who didn't speak Spanish. Now I speak Spanish. I lived in DR. Came back to my city that I left feeling like this is really home. And I, I love it. So I feel like repping my city is something that's really important to me right now. And then, you know, yeah, I would just love to go on to another project. Not every single project I do might be based in Jamaica Plain or Boston, but I'll, I'll, I'll always feel proud that I did this and be happy that, that people enjoyed it or people laughed with it or connected with it. So, yeah, on to the next project. When I'm done with this third season. <laughs> Paloma, Venezuela. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out to our Boston Talks Thank tonight. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank Thanks you, Delia.